February continues and so does Black History Month. And on today's episode of Mike's Heart Reviews, we're going to be talking about a modern black mixologist named Colin Nasser Apia and his drink, The High Tide. Let's get started. Hey there, hi there, ho there, and welcome back to Mike's Hard Reviews. My name is Mike, I'm a former bartender from the Kalamazoo area, and today we're continuing our venture into black history and mixology with Colin Asair Apia, a modern mixologist who appears in the book Black Mixolence by Tamika Hall, which actually he also helped write. So technically Tamika Hall and Colin Asair Apia. So a little bit about Colin. Colin was born in Ghana in 1969, I think sometime around August, and that's kind of where his whole inspiration for being the kind of mixologist that he is comes from. Yeah, a lot of different cultures handle alcohol differently. And in Western culture, namely the UK, Europe, Canada, the US, etc., we've got this kind of trepidatious relationship with it. We're aware that alcohol can be fun, but it's not necessarily an important part of our cultures. And it really is a balancing act between it being a good and a bad thing. In Ghana, that's not necessarily the case. And as well as with other cultures, a lot of places see alcohol not as a sort of frivolity, but as a part of in key instances of how they live their lives. For example, alcohol is used in a lot of spiritual and religious rituals in Ghana, actually, including like births, deaths, weddings, etc. Because Colin grows up in this, this space where the attitude towards alcohol is much more holistic and is representative of the sort of social nature of its use, he's got this really interesting and unique baseline to build off of when it comes to how he approaches alcohol, which will play an important part when he eventually becomes a bartender and mixologist. So Colin grows up in Ghana and he's exposed to a couple of different spirits, namely Yennefer and uh, Akpateshi, which I hope I'm pronouncing right. Uh, it is a native distilled spirit in Ghana. And those two things are like the things that pilot him into a knowledge about what alcohol is. Eventually, Colin grows up and moves to the UK to pursue a degree in marketing, which he does get. And while he's in the UK, after having graduated, he decides, eh, maybe that wasn't the thing I wanted to do, and decides to go on a bit of a break to sort of find himself and realign. Colin ends up in Greece and is hired at this nightclub and bar called QP with the help of a colleague of his. And it's there that his sort of movement towards becoming a bartender has officially begun because first of all, he does become a bartender there. And second of all, he's reaffirmed in his beliefs regarding you know what alcohol is, how important it can be for social behavior. Because he's in this instance where he's in a nightclub in this, this place he's never been before and he's seeing people come in with different motivations and, and, and you know, looking to experience something. And he draws this connection between the influence that alcohol has on sort of party culture and the role it plays in how we socialize with one another. So at QP, he, he kind of, you know, rediscovers and affirms this, this sort of internal, like the kind of internalized and like childhood era belief of like, oh yeah, alcohol is not a bad thing. It's, it's a social thing. It's a thing that we collaborate on basically. And also has the chance to meet with uh, mixologists who back then were just called bartenders before that term was coined. And he gets to see all of these different techniques and ideas and, and concepts being brought to life. And it pilots him to become a prominent bartender of somebody who has a name for himself and is like actively involved in the progression of the craft of mixology. It's in at this point, it's, it's kind of funny actually, because on record um, in interviews, Colin has stated that uh, he, when he was younger, said, oh yeah, I'll never be a bartender. I'll never do that. I'll never, I'll never, you know, go to that place. And he ends up not only just becoming a bartender, but becoming a bartender who ends up on TV for it. You see, after his time in Greece, he goes back to the UK where he ends up hosting, and I think producing a show called The Cocktail Kings, which is the first example of a primetime television show being hosted surrounding the idea of cocktails and cocktail mixology, which is, awesome that he's like the, the like head person behind like this this like the, a, a major first in the history of mixology with the help of another bartender whose name unfortunately escapes me i think david is their first name colin also opens up a bartending school in the uk called lab or the london uh, london association of bartending uh bar it's a bartending school basically and he does this with a really interesting intention because colin being a black person does notice that there's not very many black people in the mixology craft. There aren't very many prominent black bartenders and 
his thought was, oh well, yeah, let's ex let's bring this this activity to people. Let's bring our culture into this and, and and expose people to this and get people involved so that we can you know we can have a name in this and, and that's fucking awesome you know that's that's the direction he goes in he doesn't just become a bartender he becomes somebody who teaches other people how to bartend despite having been a person who said would never be a bartender colin goes on to do a bunch of different things he manages a couple of different bars one at least one of which was uh owned by jamie oliver the uk chef um, like the sort of popular alternative to Gordon Ramsay, which is fucking awesome. Currently, Colin is still a mixologist and is also uh, a brand ambassador for Bacardi. Funny thing about that, <laughs> when Colin was, you know, more focused on the marketing side of what he does, um, he said he would never work with brands. And now he is one of the many faces of the Bacardi rum brand, which is Hilarious. <laughs> so yeah, Colin is just a, a really prominent modern example of what mixology um, can be and somebody who's piloting a lot of really interesting flavors and ideas into the craft and making it their own. While at the same time promoting a lot of really progressive ideology, not just introducing mixology as sort of a, a potential career and an educative way to BIPOC individuals, but also in you know, the more modern day, focusing on LGBTQ rights as well, which is really, really impressive and amazing. Which is exactly part of the reason why I'm so glad that I picked up Black Mixolence, which he helped write alongside Tamika Hall, because in it, he features a cocktail that I think exemplifies his journey as a mixologist incredibly well. And that drink is called the High Tide, which we are going to make now. So Colin's drink, The High Tide, is a mint julep variation that appears, as far as I can tell, exclusively in Black Mixolens by Demeka Hall. And it's a really fascinating combination of a lot of different flavors that, when I first read it, I was thinking, I've gotta try this, this sounds amazing. And there's unfortunately kind of a downside to it. There's no history on it written anywhere that I could find. The fantastic thing about Black Mixolens is that it tells a lot of really prominent stories about things like the Black Mixologists Club, um, Uncle Nearest, the enslaved man who taught Jack Daniels how to make whiskey, um, John Dabney's story and the influence of the mint julep in Black Mixology, as well as highlighting a bunch of modern recipes from different Black bartenders all over the world. And that's all awesome, but unfortunately there's not, the story behind every single cocktail isn't being told, and that's not what it's for either, so I'm not you know, bothered by it necessarily, but it does mean that I don't really have much information about when the cocktail was made, what inspired the combination of flavors and ingredients. There's not much to share. I actually reached out to Colin on Instagram, hoping that he might see my message and, and respond and give me a little bit of context, but unfortunately I, I, I didn't get a reply, which is understandable. He's a busy person with a lot of things to do and he's got more important things to worry about than me. But, um, it means that I don't have a hard, concrete story to give you guys. But what I can do is sort of surmise where some of these things come from uh, and sort of discuss the cocktail in what I think is a pretty understandable way. So the High Tide is a mint julep variation, meaning it features mint predominantly and has a, a rum base. In this case, Bacardi Silver, which makes sense. Colin is a representative of the Bacardi brand, it would make sense that he would lean into using that as his base spirit. Additionally, like I said, he got his bartending start in Greece, where there is a very prominent liqueur featured in this drink that is super popular in all throughout Greece. That is this here, it's called Mastiha liqueur. And what it is, is a liqueur made from the resin of mastic trees. The mastic trees are a sort of shrub that grows exclusively on the island of Chios in Greece and it is extremely difficult to get basically anywhere else as a result. You can find this in, uh, in Europe and I think Canada, uh, the UK, anywhere with relative proximity to Greece with re reasonable accessibility. Uh, I, in the US, had to go to a specialty liquor store near me and that, would, that was willing to order some for me. Got kind of lucky that there was a bottle in stock to buy and um, Pick that up while I have the chance. <laughs> this one is uh, Castro Mastiha. Um, there are a couple other brands that are available. Um, the one that uh, Colin uses is Kleos or Kleos, uh, K L E O S. Um, that one's not available in the States, but there is a second one available in the States called Skynos, Skynos Mastiha liqueur. If you can find any one of those, they're the same thing. You can use them 
um, interchangeably from one another. Um, they're all mastic liqueurs, and that's just a big part of what makes this drink unique. If you're wondering what it tastes like, um, think gin botanicals, but in the form of a liqueur. So you're getting this kind of pine tree, pine bark, pine sap, juniper berry context, uh, black pepper, and then what I thought was really interesting was um, sort of a cucumber and melon note, which you can get on some more esoteric gins, but seems to be very unique to this product in particular. And it's what gives the drink this really fascinating, almost like the botanical fruit, light, pleasant, just gentle sweetness that is un unmatched. This stuff is really amazing. And I hope to work it into one of my cocktails, uh, you know, whatever I come up with next, because I really do want to embrace this. I think this is a phenomenal spirit. Uh, alongside uh, the base and that, that modifying liqueur uh, is honeydew melon, mint, and then some salt and pepper. Uh, and salt and pepper is probably the weirdest of those remaining ingredients. It appears in other cocktails with Bloody Marys, and it's usually for savory things, but think about melon and like the sweetness there and like mint and how salt and pepper can modify those things, it, it, it does make sense. And in this context, it doesn't make the drink salty or peppery. It just enhances some of the botanical flavors coming from the mastaha and sort of beefs the whole thing up. I know I say that a lot, but that's what it does. So it's a phenomenal drink and we're gonna go ahead and make one now. So I'm only making one minor change from the original spec of the high tide as it appears in Black Mixolence. I am not using whole honeydew. Honeydew is a pretty fibrous melon. It's not like a watermelon where you could shake it and or muddle it and produce a lot of juice. It's a bit closer to a one-to-one -one ratio of pulp to juice. The original recipe calls for two ounces of sliced honeydew melon. And well, I don't have um, a kitchen scale to use, unfortunately, to actually measure it out. So what I ended up doing was reverse engineering it by making a honeydew melon juice. This is the flesh of an entire honeydew melon blended with two cups of water and then the uh, pulp strained out with a fine mesh sieve and passed through a coffee filter to clarify it. This was the only thing I decided to change because it meant that I could get that honeydew flavor into the drink uh, without sort of having to just d destroy a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, melon and then lead to over muddling the mint component that is also going into this. I reverse engineered the spec until I found an amount of honeydew uh, juice that produces a flavor that I think is what is being done here and it comes out to about an ounce and a half. Based on my understanding of the juice to pulp ratio of honeydew melons, it would make sense that it's slightly more pulp than water so you would have to use slightly more whole fruit to get the right amount of juice. So two ounces of fruit to one and a half ounces of juice. The mathematics in my head were, were ridiculous, but it, it makes sense. So let's just get to making it and go from there. But the first thing we're gonna do is take three to four mint sprigs, depending on the size and number of leaves and throw those into a cocktail shaker. Once we've got all of our mint in there, I'm gonna go ahead and hit this with a pinch of uh, black pepper and a pinch of salt. And you're not using a ton here, at most you'd want to go for between like a quarter of a teaspoon and a half of a teaspoon at most. Really, you can kind of just eyeball it and think, how much does this need? The answer is not very much. It's not like you're trying to season a large pot of food. You're just adding a little bit to flare up the flavors and give them some extra oomph. Next up, we're going to do our masta held liqueur. We need an ounce of this. This is what makes this drink. This stuff is amazing. Um, and you, there is not really, there is not an alternative for it. I was reading up on alternatives to this. Um, people said gin a lot because of the similarity of the botanical flavors. It's not a substitute. You've really got to get the Mazda High. It's, it's a life changer. Next we're gonna do an ounce and a half of our honeydew juice. And then finally, two ounces of Bacardi Silver Rum. Now uh, we have to throw some ice in here and give it a shake to chill and dilute. As always, we're gonna go for our spec of uh, one whole cube and one cube cracked. Once we've got our ice in there, we're gonna go ahead and cap this up, slam it down. And in this case, because we want to make sure that that mint is properly pulverized and expressed, I'm gonna go a little bit longer than 15 seconds, which is usually the upper maximum I suggest, and do about 20 seconds of shaking to get this ice cold and make sure that that mint has had a full chance and opportunity to be muddled and pressed into the cocktail and also get that salt a chance to dissolve and kind of incorporate evenly. Mm. 
Now, like all good juleps, a high tide should be served into a metal serving cup, namely a julep cup, uh, with plenty of crushed ice. I still don't have a julep cup. I haven't had a chance to find one yet, but a thick uh, steel walled mug or a copper um, Moscow mule mug will work just as well. I can fit about three whole large ice cubes cracked into this. Just top it up till just below the rim and then we'll pour the cocktail in. Once we've got our uh, copper or steel or other hard metal cup filled with ice, we're gonna double strain our cocktail into it to catch all of those bits of mint and any extra pulps or undissolved salt and pepper and keep them out of the drink. To finish this off, we're gonna go ahead and grab some more fresh mint. We're gonna give that just a quick squeeze to express those oils and get it nice and fragrant. And stick that into the glass along the side where it can very happily hit our nose as we sip. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a high tide. So with our station cleaned up and our cocktail complete, we'll go ahead and throw a straw into that, just down next to that mint so we can get that experiential note on the nose. And we'll give it a nice, deep taste. Man, <laughs> every single time I take a, I make one of these, and I've made quite a few of them now, not just to get the spec I think just right, but to, to try them and enjoy them. I, I'm just in love with this cocktail so much. It's got this really natural, very nice, like, fruit sweetness. It, it, it doesn't taste sweet. The Mastaha liqueur has a good amount of sweetness to it because I think that it being a 20% you know, alcohol liqueur and it having some kind of sharp botanical flavors does mean that it probably got sweetened a little bit more on the back end as a product, but it's not enough to act syrupy here, not alongside the, the salt and the pepper and that very, very natural um, honeydew juice and the rum is kind of pulling it back. It's it, it's light. It, it's just it's the it's perfect. When you take when you take a sip, you get that whiff of fresh mint oils on the nose, and this sort of cool, crisp, like icy kind of honeydew flavor hits you, and it's got this sort of evolution to it from that mastic liqueur. It's it's got like this, like these pepper notes, and it's it's leaning into cucumber and and the rum behind this kind of this this party of these really light and gentle and like cooling flavors is is giving it this nice, very smooth, kind of neutral, but not like vodka neutral base. It's it's so so good. <laughs> Do I like this better than a regular, like, Dabney julep? Ah, yeah, yeah, I think I think maybe, maybe, maybe not. I I, you know what? I don't know. They're very different, and I think that's actually kind of cool, because in this case, this is a, I would call, a modern cocktail rather than a classic cocktail. And the difference is not just age. I think the difference between a classic cocktail and a modern cocktail is the way that it presents. Classic cocktails are about taking the spirit that you have and adding things to it to rectify it and improve it, but still embrace that spirit base. This is more about taking a flavor palette, using your spirit as a base off of which to build that using complementary flavor structures and to produce something greater than the sum of its parts rather than an accentuation of the sum of its parts. If that makes sense. I think that that was probably pretty rambly. My point is, this is delicious and a perfect example of what a good modern cocktail is, can be, and should be. Now there's a couple of interesting things about the um, High Tide I wanted to talk about. Like I said, it does appear exclusively in Black Mixolence by Tamika Hall. Go ahead and pick up a copy. It's fantastic. There are so many interesting and, and just complex and, and delicious sounding recipes in it. Um, and the next episode in the series is actually going to be about this book specifically, the writing of it, and then probably one or two, maybe my favorites uh, recipes from it that I've tried so far. But what's interesting about this cocktail and it specifically is how it appears because one, it's in the wrong spot in the book, and two, I think it might have been included as a misprint. The first of those two things, it's in the wrong section, 
The book is divided by base spirit. So there's a section on whiskey, a section on rum, a section on gin, etc. There's even a section for punches specifically. For some reason, this appears in the whiskey section, but does not have whiskey as its base spirit. And in fact, I actually went back through that whole section to make sure that it wasn't, oh, is this, does this include cocktails that are variations of, uh, of pre-existing ones that use whiskey as a, as a base? No, they, all of the cocktails in that section, all of the other cocktails, use whiskey as their base spirit. It's, it's, it's interesting. I don't know why it appears there. It's, it's out of place and like in the wrong spot. And I don't know why that, I don't know why that happened or how that happened. It's, it's fascinating. What's additionally fascinating is that I think it's, I think it's a misprint. Um, not, not that it's like wrong or that it shouldn't be in there. It absolutely should. But I think the way it's presented is incomplete. Um, there's a discrepancy between the ingredients listed and the, uh, like the steps, the recipe, the process of making a high tide because the garnish includes four mince sprigs, which we've accommodated here, but the actual ingredients don't. Yet the recipe states to muddle the honeydew with the mint, but you don't muddle the mint you use for a garnish because then it destroys it. it I don't know, it was, it was weird. I saw that and I was like, huh, that's a little weird. So I'm, I'm wondering if the way that the high tide gets put into the book uh, just it maybe it probably, it probably just got lost in the process somewhere. It just ended up in the wrong spot and then editors missed it because it was in the wrong spot. They thought, oh, maybe it's not in here anymore, something along those lines. Or maybe I have an early edition of the book from when they were first put into print and it, maybe it was a mistake they caught shortly after. I don't know. I, I haven't had a chance to look into specifically if anyone else has noticed that. Yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> As a cocktail, that's sort of an oddball variation of a julep in a good way. I don't mean that negatively. I mean that positively. Um, it's fascinating to see it, it in like the wrong place and, and with the recipe that seems like the you know like the first version that they put into the book, and then editors go through and make adjustments or notes, and then it gets finalized. I don't know. It's cool. I just think that that's really cool because a lot of the process of mixology and like, coming up with drinks is like. You have a notebook, you write down an idea, you try the idea, you modify the idea, you make notes, and then you go back, you change your, your recipe, you write down proportions, you're like, oh, no, 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 that, 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 swap that out for that. It feels very, the way, just the way it's presented feels very much like that. It feels like, oh yeah, this is like, the, a process was done to come up with this, and the editors printing the book maybe just missed the final portion of like the notes on what it was making this, and. It's just cool. And the fact that it, it sort of exemplifies everything that Colin has built up to in his cocktail career, you know, the, the influence of using Bacardi uh, silver as the base spirit and, and the specialized Greek liqueur and these really cool complimentary flavors like honeydew, which you don't see in many cocktails. It's impressive. I really do think this is a phenomenal drink. And it's one that I think I'm going to end up keeping the stuff in for in my house like all the time because the Dabney Julep made me keep mint. This is going to make me keep honeydew so that I can make these whenever I want. So thank you all so much for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Mike's Card Reviews on Colin Aserapia and his High Tide Cocktail as it appears in Black Mixolence. Um, I'll put a link in the description down below to where you can buy a copy of this book on Amazon as well as a link to Colin's Instagram where he is still active. Go ahead and give him a look, see, look up all of his other stuff and buy a copy of this book because a lot of the recipes in it are from him, him being one of the two authors. I mean, it makes sense. Go for it. It's really great. The book is worth it. I think I paid like $30 for it and there's more content in there and more history than I've gotten out of textbooks. Like <laughs> more, there's more interesting information in this than there is in some like college textbooks. So give it a look, give it a try. You're not going to be disappointed. Um, additionally, if you want to you know, see like a full recipe and a written out, you know, process on making um, that honeydew juice. I'll leave the original recipe for it down in the description below. Um, I found it on a cooking website where they were making a ready to drink version that included some other things that I omitted. Um, and if you go to my Tumblr, you'll just see what my specific process was for making that part of the cocktail. Additionally, I'm gonna try to find uh, a way to link Tiffany's Wine and Spirits um, in the description as well. If you're in the Kalamazoo area and you wanna get your hands on that Mastaho liqueur, um, the owner there, uh, who I did actually get a chance to speak with directly was like, yeah, I'm thinking about putting this in there because there's a, a an Uzu, a Nice, 
liqueur going out of stock, it's discontinued or whatever, and he wanted to fill the space. And he's like, this stuff is cool, I wanna try it. If you're looking for special spirits, they're the place to go in the Kalamazoo area, and you really can't be remiss in doing so. They really are phenomenal over there. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Hopefully you guys are enjoying uh, the series of Black History Month inspired uh, cocktail picks. And hopefully I will see you guys in the next episode where we talk about Black Mixolence by Tamika Hall. Thanks for watching. Subscribe, like, and tune in next time for the next episode. Trick responsibly, and I'll see you around. Bye.